Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Um, and welcome to the IGDC Annual Lecture 2023. And I've got this terrible problem that I've got some words I need to read out, but I can't see the words. Well, let's turn my glasses off and then turn the glasses off and I can't see any of you. Um, so my name's John Enser. I'm uh, the Director of the Interdisciplinary Global Development Centre here at York, um, and it gives me real pleasure to uh, welcome you to this year's annual lecture. Um, now, IGDC is an interdisciplinary centre for research and partnerships uh, for global development that was set up in 2017. Um, we're led out of the Departments of Politics, Environment and Geography and History. Uh, and we draw on expertise from colleagues across disciplines and faculties here at York. Um, the IGDC works with partners across and beyond the university to develop innovative and interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary challenge orientated research to address urgent, urgent and structural challenges of global development. And today's talk, I think, speaks directly to our kind of uh, aims and mission and is central to our work and to the university more broadly, and that's the topic of decolonising research. So, I'm delighted to be joined by our speaker, Professor Uma Kathari. Uh, Professor Kathari's talk is entitled Towards Decoloniality and Justice When the Past Pushes Unfinished into the Present. And without wishing to steal your thunder, uh, I know that Professor Kathari will be speaking to a number of issues that are central to concerns about our approach to research and the assumptions and perspectives that we bring to global development research in particular. <clears throat> so these include questions of how we work with history and how we think about social justice how we balance concern with the future, with appreciation of how we arrived at where we find ourselves today. And most pointedly, pointedly I, I think, uh, how so much of our work, work across disciplines has learned to ignore legacies of empire, race science, dispossession and exploitation. What do these concerns mean for how we understand global development as an area of research and practice? So, Uma is Professor of Migration and Postcolonial Studies at the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester, UK, and Honorary Professor of Human Geography in the School of Geography at the University of Melbourne, Australia. Her interests include colonialism, decoloniality, and solidarity, mobilities and borders, and environmental change and island geographies. And if you're of my vintage, you'll also know her as the author of what the book that was of uh, uh, huge importance to me personally in my understanding of development, and that's Participation, the New Tyranny, that was published by Z Books back in 2001. Um, today, Professor, Professor Kathari is uh, Vice President of the European Association of Development Institutes. He's on the advisory, advisory board of In Place of War, which is a, a support system for community, artistic, creative and cultural organisation in places of conflict, and is a founding membership of the, Story, the Storying Geography Collective. She's fellow of the UK Academy of Social Sciences and was conferred the Royal Geographical Society's Busk Medal for her contributions to research in support of global development. She's recently been awarded, been awarded a Levy Hume Major Research Fellowship from 2022 to 2025 for a project on touring Britain in the 1950s, The Adventures of Postcolonial Travellers. And it's now my pleasure to hand over to Press and Professor Kadari. Thank you. Thanks, John, for that lovely introduction, and to John and Sabah for inviting me, um, to all of you for coming, and it's so lovely to see some, some old friends in the audience too, which is great. Um, okay, so that sounds like, it, it looks like I've got loads and loads of pages, which I do, but that's because I have to print it out in 14 font so that I can read it, but it's, the eyesight's got even worse, so I need glasses and 14 font. So just in case you're going to be here, to, think you're going to be here till midnight. You won't be, I promise you. Um, okay, so it's 1992, and I took up an academic post in development studies at the university, or one of the universities in the north of England, not this one. Um, I arrived, and I was the only and first female academic. I was the only and first person of colour. And very soon, I'd only been there a couple of months, it became evident through language, through dress, through conversations, through attitudes, that some of my colleagues, my new colleagues, had previously worked as British colonial administrators. And when political independence came in former colonies, 
they were blown out of sub-Saharan Africa and, and Asia. And, um, you know, they'd been employed by the British colonial office and they had to leave when those countries gained independence and they had to find employment back in the UK. Now, it's true that many of them got jobs teaching Latin in grammar schools, but amongst those embarking on second careers were a group of individuals who thought that their experiences as colonial officers made them exceptionally well-suited to take up employment in the newly emerging and rapidly expanding international development industry in the UK in the 1960s and in the 1970s, where they were, until retirement, involved in teaching development studies. They were devising development policies, and they were carrying out consultancy work for multilateral, bilateral, non-governmental organisations. And one of them said to me, I thought, right, if I can no longer work out here in Kenya as a colonial officer, the next best thing is to be working for the development of Kenya in the development field. After all, it's the same thing. And I thought, there it is, living proof that development didn't begin with Truman's speech in 1947. If I had a pound for every student who started their essay, development began with Truman's speech in 1947, I'd be a multimillionaire. So there was living proof that development didn't begin um, in that kind of post-war period, and, but has a much longer colonial legacy. And that was, they were the sort of embodied manifestation of the coloniality of development, of a colonialism that survives the demise of empires. Now, of course, in some ways, maybe in many ways, development thinking has progressed since then. But in many ways, it continues to avoid, it seems to me, addressing deep, historically rooted structural problems, often assuming that the future, and only a particular version of the future, is all important and that understanding the past is irrelevant. Instead, responding to this or that crisis um, with a plethora of conferences, and maybe some of you have attended these, but on rethinking development or conferences on towards new perspectives, as if we just need to tinker a little bit, tinker around with development. We need to rethink it in some way, or we need to bring in new perspectives to find the right answer and all will be well. But as Lata Narayanaswamy says, we have a development system continually reinventing itself by claiming that it's the only and best source for solutions to the problems it caused. So it's become increasingly clear, I think, to many of us that when no environmental crisis, when no health crisis, pandemic, no war, no poverty, no extent of poverty and inequalities or economic crisis, when none of that is deemed alarming enough to transform the structures and the systems that create and maintain inequalities. We can't just keep rethinking. We really do, do need to fundamentally break the cycle. And a central way of doing this, I think, is to work towards decoloniality. As the indigenous scholar and artist Katarina Tiawa says, where does the crisis end, she writes, if not with justice? Of course, this isn't to deny, and I don't want to deny that there's some incredibly creative, progressive, radical work that's already under, underway. But as you're probably aware, um, calls to decolonize are currently on many agendas. Within academia, there's a lot of focus on decolonizing the university, uh, decolonizing the curriculum, decolonizing knowledge, decolonizing research. And for some people, for some of us, these extended discussions on how decolonizing um, colonial colonizing structures can be in some way unraveled. And so what I want to do is to argue that to decolonize development, we now really de do need to fully address the past and to envisage different futures. To achieve deco de decoloniality, it's essential to situate development historically, but this is fraught with tensions and challenges. There's the lure of amnesia, temporal distancing, and limited historical analysis. And all of that has meant that mainstream development discourse has been largely silent about its colonial past. And it's effectively swept away all that ample evidence that we have that present day development is founded upon relations, perceptions, and attitudes of empire. 
<coughs> and at the same time, right, so that's the sort of limited historical analysis of the past, but at the same time, the future orientation of development as something already known and prescribed is most proud, sort of profoundly exemplified, it seems to me, through the imperative to achieve goals and targets. Right? So we have this limited historical analysis. We have this lure of am amnesia. And so what we do is we turn our attention to the future, but it's not any future. It's a prescribed future right? through targets and goals. And, and so we, we, we focus all our attention on the imperative to achieve goals and targets. And what that effectively does is it closes off options to develop alternative and even more hopeful futures. So the argument here is that development needs to acknowledge its history, right, to right the wrongs of the past, if that's at all possible, to achieve some kind of social justice, and to challenge how development futures are prescribed. And I think fundamental to that project of doing that, to think of a development discourse and practice that begins with and centers decoloniality. And I'm always reminded of what Edward Said wrote. He says, and, and I'm, I'm reminding myself just as much as I'm sort of passing this on to you, this is something that, it's a bit of a mantra and I think it's really important and I do have to remind myself of this. And he says, there's a choice facing the individual scholar or the intellectual, whether to put intellect at the service of power or at the service of criticism, communities, and moral sense. Now, most of us might think, but we're putting our knowledge in the service of criticism, communities, and moral sense. Right? But are we, and in what ways are we doing that? And he's asking us to consider how we use our knowledge to challenge and critique power relations that we witness, or to support and maintain powerful relations that are so often based on and, and end up reproducing inequalities. And I focus on three considerations then for decolonizing development. First, what I want to do is to try and raise some of the issues that I think may, may create obstacles for us within development. Right? Some of the obstacles towards decoloniality. That might sound as a sort of odd way to start. Right? So normally you'd say this is what decoloniality is about, this is what we can do, but this is some of the obstacles. But I think that we're familiar with the obstacles. We know, we, we, I'm just sort of laying the ground, the context, the background for us to think about how can, then we move, how can we then move towards a progressive, more radical, creative way of thinking about decoloniality. And, and thirdly and briefly at the end, I want to talk about the power of stories and storytelling. Now, a caveat at the start though. Because decoloniality is necessarily interpreted and practiced variously as people and places experience different histories. And I don't want to conceal that diversity at all. Um, but I have to acknowledge that my narrative, my own narrative, is situated. And it can only come from a particular place and from a particular uh, geography, history and cultural perspective. So I really welcome uh, the opportunity to hear other people's perspectives. Um, and so I do acknowledge that there's growing South-South cooperation. I acknowledge that. I acknowledge the increasing investment of China in certain places in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, India's involvement in what we might call development. But I'm speaking about mainstream development in and of the West. So the obstacles to decoloniality. And I start with some of the problems with how development ideas and development practices are progressing. And I do that, so what I want to do is to illuminate why we appear to be so reticent to engage deeply with decoloniality. I can talk about decolonizing the university, decolonizing the curriculum, right? but why are we so reticent to engage very deeply with decoloniality? And when we do, why are we so unwilling to listen and respond? Well, the first, obstacle. Mainstream development discourse continues, as I said, to conceal its history, to be largely historical for a number of reasons. First, a lot of our textbooks, the history of development often rehearsed in that teaching, has a start date of Truman's speech. And what that does is obscure the colonial legacy. The second reason why we're so ahistorical is that there's an attempt I think consciously, or maybe not so consciously, 
to distance the international aid industry, to distance development from, uh, from colonialism, right? to avoid tarnishing what's presented as a humanitarian project, development, with what's now acknowledged as the exploitation of the colonial era. Okay, so we try and distance ourselves from that past. And the limited historical analysis and much orthodox development studies is partly because it's so future-oriented with its imperative to achieve those goals and targets that I spoke about. And these are most evident in the Millennium Development Goals and now in the Sustainable Development Goals. And it sounds really obvious, but a history matters. Right? So here is a Christmas card from French colonialists who wrote on the body of the colonised right, the year, Bon Anne, 1904. So how do we deal with that history? How do those, these very people who are no longer alive, but other people who they know are through further generations, we can't ignore that history. But the very body of the colonized is used in particular ways. Um, so history really matters. And decoloniality requires us to interrogate the colonial past, to understand, right, not just to understand the past, but to understand its present day legacy its present-day manifestations. And it's impossible, I think, to gain an understanding of the present without that understanding of the past. How and why have the inequalities and the violences that we see today emerged? How and why are they being perpetuated? And it's only when we have that better understanding right, of those questions that we can truly begin to forge solidarity to decolonize and achieve social justice. And here I draw on a wonderful um, article by Jean Tronto called Time Place, um, in which she argues that conceiving of the past as irrelevant has devastating consequences for our concerns for justice. Forgetting history leaves no room for remedying past injustices or for moving towards a responsible accountability. And what that does, even more than that, is once again, it puts an undue burden on those who have previously suffered from injustice. Because now, in addition to having endured that injustice, right, the suffering of the past, those who have been harmed are asked to surrender their sense of outrage, of having been wronged, <coughs> of harm. Right? Let's forget the past, let's just move on. Right? But how do you move on? In what way do we move on from that? So we need to remain vigilant um, to those historical relations which remain hidden, unrecognisable, or have mutated. That's, I think, the first main obstacle that we have when we start thinking about decoloniality, is that we're, decoloniality requires us to look in the past, to look at those historical relations. The second obstacle is that development ideas and practices are so often founded upon the creation of distinctions, of distance, of difference. Because the overarching framework within which development demarcates the boundaries that define and delimit its field of research, policy, of its intervention, is based on a number of dichotomies, of dualisms, of differences. Geographical spatial ones, global north, global south, first world, third world. Cultural that development is about a shift from the traditional to the modern. Moral, moving people from being bad to being good. Political, right? interventions to move from being autocratic to being democratic. And together, all of these work in a way to sustain that difference. Right? It forges, a, it cleaves a, a, a distinction, a difference between people. And what it does more than that is it legitimizes interventions. If we're moving from one set of circumstances to another, then how are we gonna do that but to intervene, whether it's through a development agency, through our own research and knowledge, um, through NGOs, etc. But besides those distinctions, there are also temporal ones, right? Temporal distinctions between past, present, and future that create uneven geographies of time. So perceptions of progress often assume universal trajectories of development in which certain people and places have been left behind and have to be brought into modernity through development interventions. So 
as I've said, that produces geographical spatial separations right, of over there, right, the global north and the global south over there. But it also creates temporal ones, as those places over there and the people who inhabit them are also imagined as existing back then. Right? So the past isn't simply another time, it's also another place. And we produce this distinction then between the here and now of the West that's positioned in relation to and against the there and then of the third world or the, what people refer to as the global south. So I'll just give you some examples of that. In the context of anthropology, Gelner, for example, asserts that the systematic study of primitive tribes began first in the hope of utilizing them as a kind of time machine, as a peep into our own historic past. So you're looking at people in the present in order to understand your past. So they must be living in your past in order for you to, to carry out that study. Maybe something more, um, you know, this, we, we see this most obviously in, in travel writing, but try and sort of map that on to some of the development literature that you might have read. But this is not recommended reading, is Paul Theroux's Dark Star Safari. He says, travel is wonderful for the way it gives access to the past. Markets in Africa show, show us how we once lived and traded. But in a way more worrying, is, he says, an obvious example is Dickinson's, Charles Dickinson's London, an impoverished city populated by hangers-on, hustlers, and newly arrived bumpkins like Nairobi today. Well, the bottom is Charles Dickinson's London, and the top is Nairobi today, and I can't see the similarity between those places. So, in a way, so the past is a contested terrain. But so is the, the future problematically framed. Perceptions of where we are, where we should be going, and how we move from one set of circumstances to another are predetermined in ways that foreclose the future. The future then, if you look at the SDGs for example, is predictable, ordered and regulated. It's preempted through these formal planning procedures exemplified through the targets and the future scenarios of major development agencies. And the idea is that that future can be achieved, we can arrive at that future through the adoption of a particular set of policy prescriptions right, and planning instruments that impose a predicted future within a short time frame and with known outcomes. Now, of course, we, many of us might agree with the overarching aims of the, the SDGs, but they also confine and constrain. They suggest that all people and all places can only aspire to that singular future. And those perspectives, or such perspectives and the policies that stem from them, ignore the steps and the strategies that people use to imagine and realize their own futures, or what um, Arjuna Padurai calls the capacity to aspire, people's capacity to aspire. And Doreen Massey says, for society to change, it must be able to freely absorb novelty or new information, to be fully open futures, she writes, and to be free to become. And Tronto suggests that the future looms larger than the past as a guide for our action and thought. So the present serves as a prelude to the future rather than an extension of the past. Because to acknowledge the past, to dwell in the past, means carrying forward large burdens. So what she's saying is that the present, we see the present as a prelude to the future. We don't see the present always as an extension of the past. And that privileging of the future of the past creates further challenges for thinking about justice for historical wrongdoing. Because right, why are you going to look at historical wrongdoing if we are always looking at these targets and goals and a prescribed future? So that's the second one. The first, the limited historical analysis. The second is that we absolutely keep forging and maintaining the distance and difference and distinctions between people and places. Third obstacle, and related to creating difference, is that there remains a taken-for-granted assumption 
that development ideas, development practices, development discourse, development interventions exemplify solidarity because they're founded on ideas around universal rights and an ethics of care. So we don't need to question whether we're solidaristic because we're in development. Of course we're solidaristic. Right? We believe in universal rights and an ethics of care. That's what we work towards. But rather than being about forging connections, and despite the various development goals talking about partnerships, development ideas and practice, I want to suggest, are very often anti-solidaristic. The persistence of dominant narratives that dehumanize and distance reveal, I think, the inadequacy of development thinking to instill those solidaristic principles. And at the same time, there's been an increase in commercialization, a professionalization. You know, everything's becoming more bureaucratic in development initiatives. For example, people now are talking about the solidarity economy. I mean, for me, you know, I'm a lot older than most of you, but we, we didn't think about solidarity as being part of an economy. It's about a different sort of sensibility, a different kind of activism, a different kind of practice. And so consuming solidaristically shifts our gaze away from the violence out there and the violences that we continue to per perpetuate. And instead, we think that we can shop well to save the world. Right? And here we have Bono and Ali Hewson advertising Louis Vuitton furniture, uh, furniture, luggage. Solidarity, then, is no longer a political engagement with human vulnerability. The refugee crisis really illuminated that, it seems to me, very well. And Ban Ki-moon, who was the UN Secretary General in 2015, said that the refugee crisis, and I quote, is not a crisis of numbers, it's a crisis of solidarity. Another fundamental obstacle to decoloniality is that we avoid consideration of what decolonizing means for those of us who identify with are involved in development in its manifold manifestations. Now, the process of decoloniality clearly may require many of us who are currently engaged in development to vacate the space, right? be silent, listen. Listen to the formerly colonized, indigenous, marginalized, to, deter to allow them to determine debates about decolonization and decoloniality. We can't simply add in indigenous or global south partners into our research projects we can't just add non-western readings into our you know teaching um course outlines decoloniality may mean not doing things as much as doing them it may require moving out of the way stepping aside pausing being silent Pravati ragaram says if we keep lingering we continue to assert moral authority. Now, I don't mean at all that we have no role. I don't mean to say that we have no role. Of course we do. Maybe just different roles to those we've long envisaged, and I want to come on to that um, later on. And another issue that's an obstacle for us that may prevent us from decolonizing is the perpetual cycle of co-optation of radical ideas into the development mainstream. That's for long characterized development theory, discourse and practice. So I'm really wary about some of these calls to decolonize. And my ambivalence stems from a disquiet about how decolonizing development is being promoted and understood and by whom. It's being invoked by different people applying varied and multiple meanings to it and with diverse motives. We have people who are, you know, high up in neoliberal universities who are pushing their, who can talk about decoloniality. They mean something very different. And the concern here amongst critical development thinkers is that development discourse and practice has a very long history of appropriating, of sanitizing, of purifying progressive ideas and practices and approaches. Historically, concepts and theories, however remotely radical, they don't remain so for very long within development. Instead, 
they become co-opted into the mainstream. They're appropriated by international development agencies, governments and practitioners. And in the process, they become not just ahistorical, but apolitical. Okay, so we have these radical ideas that get co-opted into the mainstream, and as they do, they become sanitized and less radical. For example, in the 1980s, feminist theories transmuted into the less critical gender and development approach. In the 1990s, participatory development became the acceptable face of a much more radical consciousness raising. And in the 2000s, the powerful theorizing and activism of anti-racism became incorporated into the language of culture and development. So it's important that we remain vigilant, that decolonization doesn't become just a more acceptable, palatable version of a radical anti-colonialism. As Zidu and Zakharat write, we're concerned by the ease which, with which decoloniality, a critique of development from centuries of anti-colonial resistance, has been stripped of its political radicalism through mechanisms of elite capture, both in the academy and beyond. So while I should be pleased that lots of people are talking about decoloniality, I'm fearful that everyone is now talking about decolonization, including those least likely to actually care very much about it. So even if decolonizing imperatives were to be more substantively deployed to inform development, given those tendencies that we've seen in the past to co-opt radical discourses or critical discourses, it's likely that they too might lose their radical edge. And maybe fifth and most provocatively, if development discourse and practice today is in part founded on a colonial legacy, manifest in, for example, what progress means and how distinctions and hierarchies between people and societies, places and cultures are forged, then is development itself, as we know it, unten untenable after decolonization? Given its colonial legacy, what and where is development after decoloniality? Will we, can we still use the term development? And will it mean the same once we've decolonized? And there's some really interesting work, just a blog written very recently by Tanya Muller, who talks about that. And it's, it, it's really important. Can we use the term development to be radical and creative and progressive? So these are some of the obstacles that we need to acknowledge to begin a process of decolonizing development. So I've kind of set up why I think this is going to be so difficult, right? because we've got many years of being a historical, of forging distinctions and differences, of not listening, of not being solidaristic in the ways in which we just assume that we are, right? and of co-opting radical discourses. So those are some of the obstacles that we need to acknowledge, I think, to begin a process of decolonizing development. What I've tried to identify, or what could and does, does derail us? What, is it, what sets us off track? And I now want to turn then to how we might start thinking, just a step towards thinking about decoloniality um, and how it's already being development, developed. Now, cause for decoloniality, as we know, aren't new. They've been evident, evident for centuries, ever since the resistance and the struggles of South Americans against European invasion, indigenous people resisting settler colonialism and colonization. There's always been resistance to forms of dispossession. There's always been refusals to be incorporated into programs that do harm and protests against the concentration and the exercise of power. And calls to decolonize knowledge and research also aren't new. For example, we've got Franz Fanon, Chinue Achebe. I mean, those of you who are, who are students and studying here, of course you have to read everything that's on your course tutor's reading list. But if you decide only to read one, read Chinue Achebe's Things Fall Apart. It's a novel. It deals with everything. Gender, colonialism, elite capture, deals with all of that. Um, and uh, Toni Morrison, of course, her novels, uh, Jamaica Kincaid, who wrote some really important polemics um, quite a few years ago. All of these addressed these issues. But despite much of this discussion on these topics, 
research, study and practice hasn't significantly altered, I want to argue. And the project of decolonising has come to the fore again as important and urgent. Not least through recent events and challenges such as the Roads Must Fall campaign that began in South Africa, protests about statues and the kinds of people and histories they represent that some of you might be familiar with. So, so far, there have been a number of key central tenets of decoloniality through maybe what we might call a post-colonial analysis. The starting point, I think, for many people who adopt a post-colonial approach, post-colonial analysis, is to identify and acknowledge the continuing legacy of colonialism in the present and the multiple forms of which it is manifest through ideas of democracy, gender, you know, what, what do they mean? Through migration and mobility, through art and architecture, urban planning. Right? So the starting point is to identify and to acknowledge the colonial legacy in the present, everywhere around us, in this room. Right? Those of you here, why are you here? Where have you come from? You know, why to York? Why to the UK? Right? All of that. And just to be aware of that continuing legacy. Second, is to bring to the fore neglected stories of marginalized figures to provide alternative narratives that can challenge those colonialist ones. Thirdly, to recognize the deep cultural and structural context in which information is gathered and knowledge is produced and disseminated. And fourthly, to challenge the economic and political systems that continue to exploit and cause harm and violence. So these are some of the central tenets of a, of a sort of post-colonial analysis. But of course, transforming principles into actual practices is easier said than done. But recently, there's been some really important and interesting work on decoloniality that reveals how colonial structures of power, knowledge, and subjectivity are inextricably, um, or are in inextricable, from the contemporary world, right? And how do you untangle that production of knowledge from a primarily Eurocentric position? There's work that recognizes that the forms of knowledge about what culture is, what democracy is, what um, education is, through which the world is apprehended and modeled for the future are deeply rooted in post-enlightenment thinking and claims to universality. And there's work that engages now really interestingly and importantly with the range of critical and radical scholarship, black scholarship, indigenous and feminist theorizing, for example. And people who argue that we, or, or encourage us to rethink the world from Latin America, from South Asia, from Sub-Saharan Africa, from indigenous places. And importantly, in these decolonial approaches, colonialism is seen as a fundamental problem and decolonization as a project. Now, taking col colonialism as a fundamental problem rather than as, as a secondary issue right, or a problem of pure historical significance means that colonialism has deeply shaped key practices, ideas, and structures in our modern world. It means that modern ideals such as progress and development Modern institutions such as the nation state, modern conceptions of knowledge and subjectivity have come into being with colonialism as a background and an implication. Decoloniality then signals a profound turn in theory and in philosophy because it goes directly against the norm of conceiving the colonial subject as a problem. Now, these understandings, I think, are hugely important. They recognize that simply labeling something as colonial doesn't make it go away. They've led to important shifts in thinking, but I think they remain constrained. Some argue that decolonization, the term itself, may not be the most appropriate word, because like colonization, it came from somewhere else. So some people, some indigenous people, are now arguing Perhaps it could be replaced with ethic of restoration, right? and that's something maybe we can consider. But I think one way to break free of these problems, to change the rhythm of that sort of perpetual circulation of ideas and their co-optation, is to make our interventions count. And that means focusing much more on the material than solely on the symbolic. 
This means more than just adding non-Western references into your reading list. Right? Or talking about decolonizing the curriculum or the university. And that's what I now want to turn to. It's 1986. On a trip with my partner around the highlands and islands of Scotland, don't, don't think you've just walked into a different lecture. This, <laughs> this is a continuation, I promise you. It's just a little narrative link. It's 1986. On a trip with my partner around the highlands and islands of Scotland, we came across a castle, a modest one by Scottish standards. The gateposts were broken and covered in moss. Much of the glass of the conservatory was shattered. The land surrounding it was overgrown. It looked absolutely derelict. We walked round to the front. The imposing entrance, the door was ajar. It was too tempting. I couldn't resist. Now, I, I do need to clarify, I don't make a habit of, you know, going into, breaking into other people's homes at all. But I felt compelled. Something was luring me in. It, I felt, it felt strangely as though I was entitled to be there. We entered and we couldn't believe what we saw. From the huge entrance hall, room after room was replete with objects, jewellery and sculptures in display cabinets and on every surface. The walls were crammed with paintings and hangings, every floor space covered with pieces of antique furniture. There was something eerily familiar about these things. And as I inspected them, on closer inspection, I realised what made them so familiar and recognisable to me was that they were all from the colonies, mainly from India, but from elsewhere too. And even though at that moment I was the interloper, I was the intruder, I felt deeply indignant. These things were stolen right? and they belonged to broadly my people. I learned that the castle has for more than 500 years belonged to a family of colonialists. Indeed, one room was completely wallpapered with Victorian colonial cartoons. And I read recently that the current heir and owner lauded insensitively, and I quote, there's plenty of stuff in our house. History is on the walls. It's written in the house. But what and whose history is written in that house? And many years later, I recalled this incident as I read and took inspiration from Tuck and Yang's groundbreaking 2020, 2012 work, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. They argue that decolonization is a question of territory, of the giving back of stolen land, of the giving back of stolen objects and resources, and as such, it is not symbolic and has real material effects. They remind us that decolonization cannot easily be grafted onto pre-existing discourses, even if those discourses are critical, even if they're anti-racist. Right? So no more tinkering around, you know, rethinking development, trying to add this, add that. There's something much more fundamental to, um, to motivate and inspire a move towards decoloniality. So even if, they, they argue, even if there are justice, radical frameworks, they cannot be added in. And those of you who've read some of the gender and development literature, there was the same argument in the 80s. You can't just add women and stir and you'll get the right development policy. Because right? there's something fundamental right, underneath that that is problematic. They argued that decolonization is far often subsumed into the directives of civil and human rights-based social justice projects without recognizing that decolonization wants and needs something different from those forms of justice. As important as their goals may be, social justice, critical methodologies, or approaches that decenter colonial perspectives have objectives that may be incommensurable with decolonization because they can be further entangled in resettlement, reoccupation. And they also say that the easy adoption of decolonizing discourse evidenced by the increasing number of calls to decolonize our schools or using decolonizing methods turns decolonization, they argue, into a metaphor. Right? It's in place of something else. Seeing decolonization as a metaphor makes possible then a whole set of evasions and a reproduction <coughs> of colonialist relations. <coughs> so decolonizing developments <coughs> 
isn't about the abstract. It's beyond rhetoric. It's not simply an academic exercise. It's not just a theory. It's beyond the symbolic. It's beyond interrogating our own individual positionality and forms of knowledge production. It's about a practice and one that is fundamentally material. It entails giving back appropriated resources and the undoing of economic structures that reproduce colonial inequalities. Now, while scholars have long shown how capitalist economic systems dehumanize populations, legitimize devaluation, expropriation, dispossession, there remains a reluctance to perform that very critical material work of redistribution and reparations right, that Tuck and Young and others argue so powerfully. Specifically, they argue that decolonization is not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our societies. It must bring about the repatriation of indigenous land, resources, and life. Consideration of the past, then, has to go beyond the symbolic. And what might this mean for development? So how can we begin to address long histories of dispossession and exploitation of people, land, resources, and objects? of the material. And one expression of this that's recently been gaining renewed momentum are campaigns demanding reparations as redistributive justice. The UN's just um, received a paper very recently by a group who want reparations for um, slavery, and maybe some of you have, have heard and read about that. Reparations as redistributive justice and the repatriation of objects stolen and appropriated through colonialism, right? legacies of European imperialism that resound today. Now, I mean, this is incredibly timely. I don't know whether you read the news yesterday that Rishi Sunak has cancelled his meeting with the Greek um, Prime Minister because he spoke on the... Uh, Kungsberg show a program and said that he wanted a return of what we call the Elgin Marbles. Right? So he cancelled that that meeting. So this is incredibly timely. I mean, this is this is on the agenda. Right? But these issues remain largely outside of the remit of mainstream development. They're not seen to reduce poverty. They're not seen to reduce inequalities. Right? We have something more urgent to go for, right? We're not going to start talking about returning stolen objects. We've got to deal with inequality and we've got to deal with poverty. And therefore, they're not considered urgent, but I think they are. I think they're hugely powerful in addressing past injustices. They can profoundly shift ongoing coloniality and can have real material effects. And I mean, I don't have time to address the reparations as redistributive justice. It's a huge issue, but I would encourage you to look more into that. But what I'm going to focus on here is on the repatriation of stolen objects. Repatriation as a form of restorative justice. So I want to explore how questioning histories and cultures of appropriation and collections opens up possibilities, right? small possibilities which hopefully will lead on to the repatriation of land, but to do this through the lens of material objects, and specifically the repatriation of what museums call artefacts. Right. When in 2019 the Maori remains were handed over to the Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa, the director of the Pitts River Museum in Oxford said, we can't undo history, but we can be part of the process of healing. In July 2022, Germany and Nigeria signed an agreement whereby hundreds of objects looted and removed by the British during colonialism and later auctioned off to Germany would be returned. A representative of the German Green Party at the time said, we have reason to celebrate. It was wrong to take the Benin bronzes and it was wrong to keep them. This is the beginning to right the wrongs. And in 2019, Manchester Museum, part of the University of Manchester where I work, in partnership with the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Islanders, Straits Islanders, established the Return of Cultural Heritage Project and began returning sacred objects to indigenous communities in Australia. And that was based on an acknowledgement that those items were taken by force under processes of colonization and they continue to have damaging effects. 
And the curator of the museum, the Manchester Museum, acknowledged, and I quote, Western processes and protocols established to catalogue, preserve, and analyse objects and specimens in isolation from traditional owners, countries of origin, and diaspora communities continue to inflict loss, trauma, and, ex and exclusion. Now, I mean, I'm talking about objects here, like physical material things, but I mean, this is what happened to people, to colonised people, were catalogued and categorised and, you know, brain size measured and you know eugenics and everything else i mean this isn't just about i'm talking about objects but of course this goes beyond that and also of course to land and at the repatriation ceremony one of the traditional owners said we share a dark history but it's moments like this when we come together as one united by our desire to do better to be better to right the wrongs of the past that we start to heal hurts and the intergenerational tra trauma that still exists today repatriation of objects he says, fosters truth-telling about our nation's history. These pro you might have heard about the Congolese activist who's taken this into his own hands in France and he's just gone into museums and groups of people and just basically steals back the things. And, um, these processes of repatriation highlight, in the words of Ross Gibson, how the past pushes unfinished into the present. Objects matter. They embody stories, histories, and social relations. That shifts the emphasis away from an understanding solely of what objects symbolize to how they've created inequalities and violence. Of course, this is just a beginning. We need to return land. It doesn't, returning objects doesn't make up for colonialism. Right? I'm just talking about one way in which we can think about moving beyond the symbolic to the material. You know, not to return the objects perpetuates colonialist ideologies right, to not return them and the argument about returning them is you know against is it, it would be an admission of guilt of complicity and i think in a way we need to really get people to think much more that it's not a loss but it's an incredible gain actually for um to return to the repatriation of stolen objects but today we can't sit back considering that those injustices that I've talked about have been created by others in the distant past, right? I mean, I'm not responsible. I wasn't a colonialist, right? Well, that happened a long time ago. Um, or maybe for us to think that this repatriation and redistribution has nothing to do with those of us concerned with development, right? And you, you may well think that. But development interventions continue to lead to the appropriation of material resources. Land, assets, natural resources, rivers, water, extractive industries, deforestation, through, for example, what David Harvey calls accumulation by dispossession, and what Saskia Sassen refers to as the brutality of expulsions. And she talks about displacements, evictions, eradications, even the gentrification of certain places, right? as we had in East London here with the Olympics, people pushed out, tourism development where people can't afford to live where their families have lived for generations. A representative of a native title Aboriginal corporation said, locked deep inside, lock, sorry, locked deep within these objects is our histories and our stories. And Lauren Tynan reminds us, Stories are held in the land and in the memory. And it's to this uniqueness, <clears throat> centrality and the power of stories and storytelling that I now turn. As Ben Okri wrote, stories are the infinite seeds that we brought with us through the millennia of walking the dust of the earth. Stories are whispers from beyond. It's 2020. While the UK was in lockdown during the COVID-19 pandemic, I spent the long, hot summer afternoons with my then 95-year-old mum, now 98, making sure to maintain social distance by sitting on the landing outside the front door of her second floor flat while she sat in her hallway. Now, despite that kind of wider atmosphere of fear, of instability, these days were magical. Our deep connections strengthened as she shared memories and recited poetry.
I relish that exquisite forgotten pleasure. You know, we only read aloud to children. I don't know why it's so beautiful to read, to be read to. Um, you know, being read to aloud. She's and she's a wonderful storyteller, and I'm absolutely captivated as her stories conjure up multiple historical and effective associations, connections between people and places, and stimulate our capacity to imagine ourselves in different landscapes, not just in the landing and the hallway. And more than that, she's always very acutely attuned to the presence of her listener. And so when she tells you a story, you feel that it's being recounted especially and exclusively for you. So in that very sort of intimate yet distant space, the past ran alongside the present and the stories began to unfold. And part of that story is of my mother as a young woman in India, an anti-colonial nationalist, fist raised, marching in protest for the independence of India. Listening to her now, an elderly woman unable to walk without the aid of a stick, the image of her protesting with purpose and passion reminds us both of her once youthful energies and of a wider politics that really shouldn't be forgotten. Now I'm very wary of recounting a personal story in an academic tradition that for so long has prioritised analysis and critical distance. But for a while now I've been thinking about stories. I've been reading critical work reflecting on the centrality of stories, of storytelling and storing, not only in a sense to uncover a value to communicate the intimately involved, the unfinished, the embodied, but maybe it's possibly the only way to begin to help us unfold new and radical and progressive insights, to bring those whispers that Ben Okri uh, refers to into sharper focus. And Edward Said argued that the unrepresented stories of others are essential to identify how those formerly colonised confront their entanglement in processes through which they've become defined and confined. So recounting, telling, publishing stories can be empowering acts. They can subvert the systemic silencing of those marginalized and those ignored. They can create a space maybe to reclaim personhood and importantly, they can incite political change. And stories also can save lives and storytelling is a political act. Since as Ross Gibson puts it, while our stories can start and stay in privacy, we can also use them to pronounce to and on the larger world. Some of you might be familiar with Baruth Bokhani, No Friend But The Mountains, the book that he wrote from Manus Prison, a memoir written from the detention centre that, where he was for six years in 2019. Now this book that he wrote, it was composed over his six year detention in the asylum centre. And it was thumbed one text at a time on a smuggled phone. And through that one text at a time, through the smuggle phone, through six years, it's, you can't, it's not 3D, you can't see, it's a big book. Um, he wove together a community of witnesses around the world. Right? We, were, we then became a witness to what he and others were experiencing. So stories also have rhythms. Some are progressive, while others, I, I want to acknowledge, can incite injustices, of course, and violence. As Ben Okri reminds us, anything that affects our perception of the world usually comes in the form of a story. But that means we must always be aware of the stories that we imbibe. In his chapter, Decolonization and the Stories in the Land, um, which is in this book, Imagining uh, Decolonization, a very important book by some New Zealand writers, um, Mona Jackson presents a transformative vision um, and, and uh, writes... The fact that colonization necessarily involved the brutal taking of indigenous people's land and lives has also been reframed and justified in stories that range from pseudo-scientific and legal rationalizations to blatantly racist assumptions, presumptions. Indigenous peoples have spoken back against such stories, but they remain the dominant narrative. Yet perhaps through processes of decoloniality, these stories are in the process of coming apart perhaps to be replaced by new and better stories. So stories are now being increasingly acknowledged within development as having power to affect change that can alert us to injustices and also include, of course, other creative forms, not just about stories, but you know, through music, dance, art, literature, 
all powerful tools, I think, that we need to accept and, and uh, spend more time focusing on. So in conclusion, it's the problem of the forgetful past and the unobserved future that challenges the potential for remedying past injustices, or indeed for moving towards a responsible accountability. Now, while it's tempting to look towards the future, every indication suggests that those who fail to learn from the past are doomed. They're not doomed just to repeat it, but they're doomed to think that they've escaped it. So the fear is that we're going to think we've escaped the past when actually it's all around us and it's affecting our, <coughs> the ways in which we move towards social justice. Only if we're willing to give the past its due will we have any firm ground to stand upon and the possibility, I think, to create, to imagine, to pursue more hopeful futures. In Return to My Native Land, the Martinican poet, author and politician Emma Césaire wrote, No race holds a monopoly of beauty, of intelligence, of strength. There is a place for all at the rendezvous of victory. And I feel that his sentiments are especially salient now and are worth repeating, because he reminds us that our encounters and interactions with others are not invitations to focus on deficiencies, on differences, on conflict, but are opportunities for enrichment. So the past will keep pushing unfinished into the present, and clearly what this requires is a politics of restoration and hope, but then that's another story. Thank you.